Imagine coming to work and stumbling upon a body. Officials tell us that's exactly what happened here. This is such a horrific tragedy for this tight knit community. Behind me there is the scene and that is where law enforcement officers from around the state have been out here for more than 10 hours. La situación se complicó más cuando la familia llegó a la casa y dio cuenta que no había electricidad. Yeah, I'm here on West Campbell Road and this yard was covered in uprooted trees around 9 this morning. So a lot of progress is being made here. The Kathleen area was the hardest hit. So you can like really see inside of there. Yeah. The only state-owned autonomous vehicle testing site in the country. More than 250 pages of the school district's investigation into this incident. Investigators believe that Yasmin was wearing headphones as she approached the railroad tracks. They also believe that she was looking down at her phone as the train was coming. Hey, you got a million knees. You got a million knees. Hey. <laughs> Now a veteran in the rap game. And Stephanie, I want to bring you in so you can share mm -hmm. your story on this. You recently decided for Black History Month to let your hair uh, be natural. So, so explain your decision there and sort of your journey on, on this topic. Well, Holly, I wanted to wear my hair um, in a curlier uh, style. I'm usually flat iron it straight. And I wanted to let young girls as well as other women of color know that you can wear your hair in a curly style and still be successful in news. I have been texting back and forth with Rachel Jones since April 1st. She was too sick to talk until now. She said the nightmare all began for her family when her husband returned from Israel on March 18th. Missionary Danny Jones thought he wouldn't get COVID-19 when he left for this trip to Israel March 8th. And everybody kept reassuring him this is not a big deal. But as the COVID-19 pandemic quickly progressed, Israel was put on lockdown. He returned home Wednesday, March 18th, with a slight fever. The family quarantined at home. In our oldest daughter, who was 16 years old, um, she locked herself into her room. By that Sunday, Danny's fever spiked to 101. He went to get tested. He started coughing. The symptoms got worse, and later that week, he found out he tested positive for COVID-19. By that time, Rachel and their three daughters, ages 10, 13, and 16, had all already started experiencing symptoms. All four of us started having a terrible headache, body aches, and we started running low-grade fevers. <clears throat> Sorry. She still has the persistent dry cough. It's just so hard to go to sleep when you have that feeling like you're suffocating. Danny was taken to the hospital, and the next day, Rachel and her girls got tested and learned they were positive two days later. At that moment, for you, what was that like? At this point, all of the major symptoms had set in. The girls were barely eating. They were barely drinking. Miserably ill and taking care of her sick children, it started to take a toll on Rachel. And I cried a lot behind the scenes. Her husband was in the hospital for five days before returning home. And that wasn't the end of hospital visits. Their oldest daughter, Tara, was rushed to the emergency room. She was severely dehydrated. Every time she would get out of her bed just to go to the bathroom, she would black out. She stayed at the hospital for a few hours, then returned home. With her being so scared, she, you know, said, I'll drink a water of gallon, a gallon of water every day. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want to be away from you. Rachel said the virus just does what it wants. Some days the fevers are gone, then they come back. I would say the overwhelming message that I would say to people is to take this seriously. Rachel and her husband Danny are still dealing with fevers with no clear end in sight. They are asking everyone to pray for them. I'm Stephanie Claytor. I'll send it back to you. 37 year old Monica Young recalled seeing COVID-19 patients on stretchers filling the hallways as she arrived at New York City Health and Hospitals Harlem on April 6. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of cases and first looking at it, it was overwhelming. I imagine you saw a lot of death. Oh, yes. Um, I think 
the hardest thing for me was um, a lot of the patients that died, they didn't get to die with their loved ones or their um, family. Instead, she and other nurses held their hands. If they was not able to get back home, at least they were able to have someone hold their hand and pray with them if needed to be so they wouldn't die alone. That, that was... Do you remember how many people you witnessed die or did you stop counting? I stopped counting. She said the majority of patients came in complaining of shortness of breath, but some only had low grade fevers. They were not symptomatic. They were walking, they were talking, and within a few hours we were intubating them. The good news, she said about half of the patients on the COVID-19 floor she worked on were discharged during her time there. Monica is in quarantine in her room for 14 days. She tested negative for the virus while she was in New York. She said she got tested again when she got off of the plane here in Florida. She's awaiting those test results. Stephanie Clay Tour, Spectrum News. Two sisters reunited after Hurricane Dorian tried its best to take one of their lives. Just overwhelmed to get out. The Category 5 storm flooded Shiante Russell's home on Great Abaco Island, causing her, her husband, and two young children to leave on a flatbed truck and head to a shelter. The, the toilet started to flood. The water just gush, gush. And everything started to shake. One spell we heard something hit my bedroom and then BAM! It wasn't, it wasn't nothing ordinary. The stench outside is something she'll never forget. Just dead. Be it animals, be it human beings, I don't know, but fishes in the water, like, you know, whatever, you just have to go. The family sought shelter in this government complex for four days. She said there were about 170 people there at the time and one bathroom. The shelters are horrible. All of them are horrible. Everyone had to fight for their own food. Um, there wasn't enough water. As soon as they heard flights were available, they got their tickets and headed to Nassau. Abaco is no longer. Um, I don't know when it will ever become like Abaco again, like the Abaco I know because seeing it how it is uh, it can be very traumatizing. It can be very like, what is it? Because this is nothing that we know. This is nothing that we call home. Chiante is also shaken up about the people who didn't survive. She said she's lost three co-workers. We lost a lot. I lost a lot of my friends. She called it a bittersweet moment when the family left Bahamas for Florida. Now here with her sister, Dominique Alexander, she feels the family can finally rest. I'm just trying to get away, I'm trying to get my kids away from it because like I said, there's nothing left to go back to at this point. Shiante said she has no idea what is next. For now, she'll stay with her sister, Dominique, and all she can think about is her family is safe and alive. In Orlando, Stephanie Clay Tour, Spectrum News. Mm, okay, and my kisses. Mwah. Maine Montague now has to raise three-year-old Paris alone. Every day is definitely tough for us. She has nightmares, and then sometimes she has dreams where her mom is actually there. And, um, you know, with me not sleeping, I usually hear the whole conversation, and you can just hear her say, Mom, come on, let's go. Or, Mommy, no, I'm, I don't want to get up. <laughs> she's old enough to remember her mom, Jessica Montague, and be aware she's no longer there. What's Mommy's name? Mommy's name is Jessica. Oh, you remember? Yeah. Was mommy very pretty? Yeah. Maine calls Jessica his soulmate. They had just celebrated their one year wedding anniversary when she was killed. She worked out with him and they even worked on cars together. This was her baby. You know, other than her three kids, this was definitely her baby. You said you're having trouble sleeping. Yeah, I've, that's been since day one. I, 
I know I usually go a couple days without sleeping. He said staying busy is the only thing that keeps him going. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about my wife and think about where we would be now. I feel like one day she's still going to come home. But he knows through their daughter Paris, Jessica's legacy lives on. Stephanie Clay Tor, Spectrum News. Yeah, I'm here on West Campbell Road, and this yard was covered in uprooted trees around 9 this morning. So a lot of progress is being made here. The Kathleen area was the hardest hit. I live near here. I can tell you it was some frightening moments last night, and still the power is out. Cracked windows and windshields, dented cars, and backyards and roofs destroyed. Extensive damage in around the Ashley Point neighborhood just north of Kathleen. My daughter had just walked out of the room, her room, and a tree came right in over her head just as she walked out. It reminds me back of Irma, but worse, because we didn't have any structural damage hardly at all there except roof, uh, some roof shingles. Frances Palermo was asleep when the tornado hit. She said the noise woke her up. The floor moving and the noise boom, boom, boom. It's on the window. She got her father out of the guest room just before her fence came flying through the window. Frances, a native of Puerto Rico, said she had no idea what was going on at the time. Have you ever been in a tornado before? Never in my life. The roof on her home is destroyed, along with her kids' playhouse and trampoline. Two miles down the road, Kathleen Middle School also received extensive damage. It's very, very extensive to all floors. There's a basement, there's a middle floor, and there's a top floor. All three floors are damaged. Computer labs are damaged. Um, everything that's in there is basically have been, it's going to be trashed. School will be closed Monday and Tuesday as crews make repairs and bring in portables. Our meteorologist Mike Clay says that this is the second EF2 tornado to hit the northern portion of Polk County in recent years. Back in 2017, during Hurricane Irma, another EF2 tornado hit Polk City just east of here and also caused extensive damage. Live near Kathleen, I'm Stephanie Clay Tor, Spectrum News. The worst that could happen to a mother. Rosa Lopez is supposed to be celebrating motherhood this weekend. Instead, she's mourning the loss of her son, Jesus Navarro. She says her heart is shattered. Her 13-year-old son was hit while walking near their home. She can't believe the driver took off instead of calling for help. Rosa said this has not only been tough on her, but his siblings as well. Today, the family held his funeral. Hundreds attended. Gracias a todas las familias que me, me ha apoyado. She thanks the families who've helped her. For the next nine days, her family will uphold the Mexican tradition of praying, praying for Jesus' soul and for answers. Todos los niños corre peligro. Rosa says all children are in danger if authorities don't figure out who hit her son. In Hillsborough County, Stephanie Clay Tour, Spectrum Bay News 9. In Puerto Rico, todavía necesita voluntarios que hablen español. Cuando Julio de la Rosa oyó que Puerto Rico tenía comida llegando después del huracán, pero no había conductores de camiones disponibles, inmediatamente respondió. Cuando escuché la noticia, eh, rápidamente dije, tengo que hacer esto pa para Puerto Rico. Tomó todo su tiempo de vacaciones, tres semanas en total, para ser voluntario de Red Cross allá. Todos los días manejo el camión por los barrios rurales en las montañas donde fuera bien difícil a llegar o salir en carro. Cuando te veían a ti, creían que tú eras un ángel que bajaba del cielo. Y cuando uno venía con su agua en la mano y su comida, mucha gente lloraba. Saludos por la Cruz Roja, saludos. Julio dice que siempre va a recordar a esta familia, una de muchas que recibió a su ayuda. La casa era un refugio para ocho familiares. Julio y su grupo de voluntarios fueron los primeros en llegar para darles comida. Ahí no había forma de llegar. Nosotros llegamos allí y esa gente comenzaron a llorar bien. Tú sabes, los niños, ¿no? como que le llevaron comida, tú sabes. Llevamos leche, llevamos pampers, llevamos cosas para los niños también. 
Y en la tarde, cuando se terminó su día con Red Cross, salió otra vez para dar comida sobrante a la gente viviendo en las calles en casa. Yo decía, ¡comida! Y todo el mundo salía corriendo, todos los hombres venían corriendo pa, a buscar su comida. Nos dijo que es la vacación más memorable en su vida. En Lakeland, Stephanie Claytor, Spectrum Info Más. Now on Spectrum Bay News 9. This is a spree killer. This guy needs the death penalty if there's ever been a person that needs the death penalty. A murder suspect caught in Polk County. He's accused of killing three people crossing state lines. We have the latest on his arrest. Plus, the MSD Public Safety Commission is meeting today. We'll break down the topics that will be discussed regarding school safety. Thanks for joining us. I'm Stephanie Clay Tour. It's October 15th, and this is Spectrum Bay News 9 News Weather Now. Continuing coverage now, a suspected murderer has been arrested in Polk County. Our deputies put their life at extreme risk last night to protect the community. I'm exceptionally proud of them once again, as I am every day. The search for Stanley Mossberg began last night following a double homicide in Winter Haven, but authorities say he was already wanted for murder in Tennessee. Spectrum Bay News 9's Dave Jordan is on scene in Polk County with the latest. 35-year-old Stanley Mossberg is accused of launching a killing spree across two southern states. Investigators tell us that he randomly targeted a man. In the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Commission is meeting today in Osceola County. The commission is preparing its second report for state lawmakers in wake of the Parkland school shooting. Spectrum Bay News 9's Rick Elmhorse is on scene in Osceola County with more. Lots of frustrations expressed at this morning's commission meeting over a couple of different issues. Thank you, Rick, for that report. We'll see you again at 5 with more information on today's meeting. Now to Tampa, where an investigation is underway. A toddler was left inside a car, and that toddler has died. Tampa police say the child's death appears to be a tragic accident. They tell us the little girl's parents called 911 around 6.30 yesterday evening after they found her unconscious in the back seat of their Jeep. The one and a half year old was rushed to the hospital where she passed away. Investigators say the family has several children and it was a hectic morning trying to get everyone where they needed to be. They say the father normally drove the kids in the Jeep, but decided to switch cars yesterday. Because sometimes if a toddler is asleep, it happens. I mean, it's, it's hard to wrap your brain around, but sometimes it happens that somebody just forgets that somebody's in the back seat and you, we have a tragedy on our hands. Right now, it's unclear whether charges will be filed. Beyond the Bay, an accused killer is back on the stand in Orlando today. Markeith Lloyd is charged in the death of his pregnant ex-girlfriend. Today, the state is questioning Lloyd on the stand. Yesterday, he spent several hours answering his lead defense attorney's questions about his life, his beliefs, and what Lloyd described as a troubled relationship with Sade Dixon. Investigators say he killed her in December 2016, then went on the run. Lloyd is also accused of killing an Orlando lieutenant. That will be a separate trial. Michelle John Chuck, the mother of John John Chuck, could spend the next two years in prison. She was sentenced to 24 months yesterday for a 2018 charge of fleeing and eluding authorities. John John Chuck is currently serving a life sentence for throwing his five-year-old daughter, Phoebe John Chuck, off the Dick Meisner Bridge back in 2014. All right, switching gears now. Everyone knows April 15th is tax day, but if you're one of the 15 million taxpayers who punted in the spring, your real tax day is today. That's when the Internal Revenue Services extension deadline is. 
And they say that last year, if you did not pay those taxes, then your get out of jail free card will stop working. Of course, you won't literally go to jail, but you will likely have to pay big penalty fees. For those who still can't pay, the IRS will work out payment plans. A few special exceptions exist for certain situations, like people who have dealt with natural disasters. The first time penalty abatement program also helps some taxpayers who don't have histories of paying late. Decision 2020 News Now, a major Democratic debate showdown in Ohio tonight as 12 Democratic hopefuls gear up to take the debate stage for the fourth and perhaps for some the final time. While impeachment has hogged headlines in Washington, another key current event will likely come to light tonight, Turkey and what's happening to our Kurdish allies. Spectrum Bay News 9's reporter Molly Martinez is in Columbus with a preview. Thick smoke billows in northern Syria. As you might have noticed, seven candidates did not qualify for tonight's debate, and the threshold for next month's debate is even higher. New details now on the impeachment inquiry launched against the president. Recently resigned State Department advisor Michael McKinley is set to testify in the House tomorrow. That's according to two congressional sources. McKinley stepped down last week. His testimony is part of a busy week for the committees leading the House impeachment investigation. Five current and former administration officials are expected to appear on Capitol Hill this week. Still ahead on Spectrum Bay News 9, who gets the credit for the Cuban sandwich? We'll explore the origins of the Tampa Bay staple as we celebrate the last day of Hispanic Heritage Month. Stay with us.